Boldwood presents The Forgotten House on the Moor Written by Jane Lovering And read by Rose Robinson The moral right of the author has been asserted This performance is owned by Boldwood Chapter 1 I defy anyone to be happy to see the police on their doorstep at 4am I mean even in the case of a returned lost puppy or the finding of your previously stolen car, at four o'clock in the morning, practically everybody is going to be a bit tetchy, aren't they? Especially since I hadn't lost a puppy, my car was still sitting on the road outside my window and hadn't been the victim of any crime. So the two police officers knocking at my front door were mere unwelcome interruptions to a dream about Ben Wishaw and a trumpet. At first, it was just a knock. Loud, peremptory, and clearly not allowing any turning over and ignoring. In lieu of traipsing all the way downstairs in the dark of a chilly June morning, I opened my bedroom window and stuck my head out. Hello? Mrs Donaldson? The two uniformed officers had to take a step back to look up at me beyond the burgeoning ivy growth that was crawling up the front wall like something out of a horror film. I was still too half asleep to wonder at their presence. I made one of those early morning noises that might be agreement or clearing my throat. Mrs Alice Donaldson? The younger of the two tilted her head up now. No, there's fourteen of us in here. I snapped and then felt instantly guilty. They were only doing their job and they probably weren't any happier about it being the early hours than I was. I yes, yes, that's me. Sergeant Anthony Williams and Constable Carly Evans. Here we come in. I stood for a moment, looking down. The street lights were competing with the vague light of early dawn, nasty sodium shadows bleached by the tentative sneaky grey daylight in the empty road. Even the bins, crowded on the pavement for the morning collection, looked suspicious. I felt a presentiment of something nasty tingle down my spine. Why? We'd rather come inside if you don't mind. They'd taken their hats off. That meant bad news, didn't it? I rattled down the stairs to open the front door, heart pumping, desperately trying to think of anyone I knew who might have died, but I couldn't think of one single person whose removal from the world would have caused me a 4am disturbance. My parents were both long gone. There was my brother, but his wife would be the one to inform me of his passing probably accompanied by complaints about him leaving the lawn unmown and a DIY project half-finished. The remaining aunts and uncles all had the cousins to fall back on in the event of their demise. It gave me a sudden realisation of how alone I was in the world. But then, I rationalised during my gallop along the hallway, doesn't everyone feel like that at 4am? Cautiously wrapping my dressing gown tightly around me as a fleecy defensive shield between the police and my very unglamorous pyjamas, I opened the front door to find the police officers had bunched up into my tiny half-roofed porch like a pair of vampires eager to avoid the dawn. Come through. I ushered them, uniforms brushing the hallway walls, down to the living room, still littered with the detritus of a single woman's evening at home, unplumped cushions and a plate of toast crumbs and biscuit wrappers. Sorry, it's a bit untidy. Sit down, Mrs Donaldson, suggested Sergeant Williams, the tall male one. Please, he added when I picked up the plate and a couple of old mugs and stacked them on a side table. I'm afraid we have bad news for you. Calling me Mrs Donaldson is bad enough, I said, trying to lift the atmosphere of gloom and realising that I'd left last night's sock straight over the arm of the sofa. You are Mrs Donaldson, married to Grant Donaldson. The other officer looked around the room as though she expected to see stolen silverware heaped to the ceiling and Lord Lucan grooming Shergar over by the sideboard. And this is 22 Kringle Moor Road, Pickering? Well, yes, I just meant... But I was spoken over. Mrs Donaldson, I'm very sorry to inform you that your husband has been killed. Both police officers acquired sombre expressions. Is there anyone we can call? Anyone you'd like to have with you? What? 
What? I'd heard the words, but it was as though my brain couldn't make sense of them, as though the policeman had been talking Polish or Martian or making random noises. Grant. Killed. Those were the salient words, but even those wouldn't penetrate the fog of confusion to gel into an image. I'll get you a glass of water, the policewoman said, and there were noises of someone walking over the sticky, unwashed vinyl of the kitchen floor and rummaging around on the draining board for a clean glass. The pipes gurgled for a moment and then dispatched their usual reluctant trickle. I could only sit. I take it this has come out of the blue. The policeman sat down and crossed his legs. A magazine slithered from the arm of the chair he was sitting in to lie like a cast-off snakeskin in the pool of light from the overhead lamp. When did you last see your husband? Grant. Killed. The words didn't mean much more now that I'd given them a chance to permeate the layers of emotion and they settled in the sediment of things that have happened at the back of my mind. About six years ago, I said. Six years? Well, he left me, you see. Said he didn't want to be married anymore, packed a suitcase and went off. I heard he'd moved to York, but... I shook my head. We never bothered to get a divorce, and I've been tearing up any posts that came for him. With less and less ferocity as the years passed, it must be said. So, yes, about six years. I took a deep breath. How did it happen? Surely it wasn't murder. I had to struggle to imagine Grant generating sufficient emotion in anyone to justify a killing, apart from the savage hatred I'd felt at being left with the bills and unfulfilled social obligations. Even his leaving hadn't made me feel murderous. Grant now existed in my memory as a streak of opinionless grey and a stammered range of, I'm not sure, whatever you like, I don't mind, whatever you want to do. The female officer came back in, walking carefully as though afraid that she might spill water, although what harm she thought it could cause to my 1960s furniture and ancient holy carpet, I didn't know. It had taken her such a long time to bring the water through from a kitchen only a matter of steps away that I presumed she'd been scanning the walls and reading my reminder board, searching for any clues that I might have detonated my ex-husband. It was a gas explosion. She handed me the glass and I sipped water, as though it were expected of me. A gas explosion? Where? I mean, do I have to identify him? And then what about a funeral? Who sorts that out? Is that me, or...? Time must have been passing because I heard my neighbour's front door slam and his footsteps on the brick path as he took their dog for its early walk. But in here... There seemed to be a stasis field holding me in that moment of Grant killed. There was no grief. It was like hearing that a distant acquaintance had died suddenly. A sadness that wrapped itself around the memories of happier early days of laughter and faint affection. But then was spiked and punctured by remembering the years of our marriage. The police officers exchanged another look and pulled those, this is going to be tricky, typefaces. Er, uh, said one. The explosion was in a deserted house high up on the moors. Why she made it a question, I didn't know. Was she expecting me to say, no, it wasn't? We don't know the exact circumstances. We were hoping you could help us with that. Six years, I said, suddenly testy. I couldn't even tell you what haircut he had, let alone a house on the moors. What the hell was he doing up there? It was the old Fortune House. As though that explained anything. I'd never heard of the old Fortune House and didn't know whether it was a noun or a name. Was it like the Oak Island Money Pit? It would have been just like Grant to go looking for buried treasure, trying to get along whilst putting in the least amount of effort seemed to be his life's goal. It was supposedly haunted. The policeman finished. Empty for the last year or so, since old Miss Fortune died. Someone's been using it to do ghost hunts. What do you call them? Vigils, 
put in his sidekick. This professor type from the university has a group. They go up there and sit around in the dark trying to talk to ghosts. My brain did the shutting down thing again. Grant and ghost hunting were about as far removed from one another as Sydney Harbour Bridge and my front porch. I could not think of one single reason why Grant would have been in the Fortune House. Anyway, the place had propane heating and we think a cylinder got damaged or something. Your husband went up there for a solo... vigil. The policeman threw a glance at his companion who nodded. And maybe lit a cigarette or set off a spark or something and... Well, because the place is so isolated, it burnt for three days before anyone noticed anything was wrong. A pair of walkers eventually called it in. A woman, I said suddenly. No, it was two men. What? Uh, the policeman said again. What do you mean? There had to be a woman. He was meeting a woman up there. It's literally the only reason Grant would be that far from a takeaway. Oh dear. I was clearly doing cheated on wife from the expressions on their faces. We've not found any... traces of anyone else, said the woman carefully. Traces, I repeated. I couldn't, for any money, have told you how I felt then. There might have been a tiny bit of schadenfreude, if I'd been honest. Grant had refused to grow up, refused to accept that a life of mundanity and responsibility and bill-paying was his future, and he'd died in a flaming house in the middle of nowhere. Possibly the best I-told-you-so moment in history. But a man I'd loved enough to marry, even if only briefly, had died. How was I supposed to feel? There were no templates for this situation. We found your husband's wallet. And his belt buckle. And a tooth. I stood up in case they were going to go through a more extensive list, but they seemed to have stopped. The water from the glass I'd been holding slopped onto the floor, but I didn't bother to do anything about it. So, I began pacing. You're telling me that my husband, my ex-husband, who I've not heard a word from in six years, has been incinerated in an explosion in a deserted house miles from anywhere. They both made, that's about the size of it, faces. And all that was left of him was his wallet, a belt buckle, and a tooth. Propane gas. The male of the pair was also very young, I realised. He looked nervous, as though he was afraid I was about to start cackling like a movie villain, and I thought this might well be his first time breaking the news to a relative. He seemed to be simultaneously worried and slightly proud. It's very unpredictable. The, uh, items were damaged, but appeared to have been jettisoned during the explosive phase. Like I said, the fire burnt for several days. The remains of the house fell into the basement, which sort of bank the fire. Your husband? He stopped so suddenly that I wondered if the policewoman had kicked his ankle. We will clear the debris, of course, and try to find any... further remains, she said delicately. There will be an inquest, but the intensity of the heat and the weight of the falling masonry... I'm sorry, Mrs... Alice, but we may not recover sufficient remains for a funeral. She looked at my face. You can, of course, have a memorial service, she added hastily. That's what they did for my uncle when he was lost at sea. There didn't seem much more to say after that. They quizzed me lightly, presumably to make sure that Grant and I really had been separated with no knowledge of one another's movements, although the lack of any photographs of him and the fact that I had to go and hunt one out to give them in case they needed it seemed to reassure them of that fact. Then they went, leaving me with numbers to call should I need to, still holding a tumbler full of room temperature water, most of it now over my pyjama clad legs. And Grant, still dead. Personal testimony, received second hand from the daughter of the couple involved. In October or November 1966, my mum and dad were members of a walking group who regularly walked several routes across the North York Moors. 
My mum told me this story on several occasions and the details never varied. They, and a group of six or seven, had set out from a spot near the Whitby Road to walk across towards Levisham Moor and they were passing near the Fortune House when a fog came down suddenly. Mum had been walking near the back of the group and she found herself cut off from the others and lost. She stopped walking and called out. She was a bit scared and the path up there was known to be boggy and difficult and she didn't want to end up in one of the marshy areas. The fog was really thick and she couldn't see more than a couple of yards. She couldn't hear anything apart from some sheep and water dripping. She knew she was reasonably close to the Fortune House and she thought she ought to find her way up there to wait for the rest of the group to come and look for her. So she started up the hill towards where she thought the house was. She said that she thought she must have walked around in circles because there was no sign of the house or any building and it was starting to get dark. She was really frightened by this time because she couldn't see any of her group or anyone about and she was cold and wet and lost so she sat down on her pack and started to cry. A few minutes later, she saw Dad and another man coming towards her through the fog. She didn't recognise the other man, but she said he was young, wearing a cap and tweeds like all the farmers did back then, and she assumed he must have heard her crying and told the rest of the walking group where she was. Dad got her up and made sure she was all right, while the other man just stood in the background. She couldn't really see him because of the dark and the fog, she said he was there, watching as if to make sure she didn't need any help, and then it got so dark that she couldn't see him anymore. Dad started leading Mum off towards the rest of the group, who were waiting close by. They decided not to go on any further because of the fog, and they were going to set up camp while they waited. Mum said that she wanted to thank the young man for coming with him to help her. But Dad said there wasn't anybody else. He'd noticed she was missing and the group had been looking for her for about half an hour. He said nobody had come with him and he hadn't seen the young man in the cap who'd been standing next to him when he found Mum. Chapter 2 It took me a week to sort the jumbled assortment of thoughts in my head into cohesive action. An inquest was opened and adjourned, apparently, absolutely normally. I wasn't required to attend, but did anyway and the police kept me up to date with slightly diffident phone calls. I managed to ascertain the rough location of the Fortune House and get compassionate leave from my job, although Sheila, the office manager, did remark that compassionate leave was being rather stretched as a term, but we had policies for spousal bereavement, which I insisted on keeping to, even though spousal was even more stretched as a term. I couldn't explain, not to her, nor Malcolm, nor any of the others at Welsh's windows, why I felt this need to see where Grant died. Maybe it was a kind of morbid curiosity, or maybe I was searching for a definite closure to our marriage. But whatever it was, I wanted to go there and find out what was so special about that bit of moorland that it had drawn my resolutely urban-dwelling husband out of town. It was a week to the day after I'd been so abruptly woken that I found myself rucksacked and booted, following a tiny trail on an enormous map to try to find the Fortune House. The map had to be large in order to have the scale necessary to even locate the track, and it flapped and bent in the wind like a sail. I kept losing my place and having to sit on small clumps of damp heather to try to find myself again, tracing my route with a fingernail whilst fighting off disturbing memories of a long-ago Duke of Edinburgh expedition across similar terrain. I hadn't liked the wide, stretch skies or the featureless curves of moorland any more twenty years ago than I did now. The knee-high growth concealed random holes and boggy patches, and I bucked and plunged my way along with my map sheet flapping, like a schooner breasting the waves of the Atlantic. I didn't do walking. I didn't go in for the waterproofed gallivanting around mountains and hills with names like Black Gill and other medieval barons. My hobbies tended toward the sedentary. TV, magazines, avoiding housework, things like that. Not this relentless striding across featureless landscapes, occasionally interrupted by face planting into thorny bushes, or sudden knee-deep squelches into hidden bogs. I am not an outdoor person, I breathed heavily to myself, 
adjusting the straps of the rucksack borrowed from Malcolm, who was our entire accounts department. My natural habitat comes courtesy of Sofa World, and the only wildlife I want to see has David Attenborough attached. Bugger! I caught my foot in yet another snarl of skeletal growth and unseen pothole, and dropped to my knees yet again. But more to the point, what the hell was Grant doing out here? And now I'm talking to myself. Well, this is it now. I might as well go home and buy 17 cats and resign myself to being a woman who mutters to herself in supermarkets. I pulled myself up to standing and found I was being watched. Up until now, my relentless hours of moorland walk had only been observed by inscrutable sheep or birds that I hadn't paid any attention to because of the lack of wildlife narration accompanying them. But it seemed that my most recent lurch had brought me into someone's eyeline, and from this lower level I could see a man, hand up to shade his eyes from the light, watching me from behind a narrow clump of windswept trees, halfway between me and infinite distance. He was an outline, a sketch against the somewhat uneven horizon of burgeoning heather and gorse bushes, rocks and sky. I couldn't make out much detail, other than dark clothing, dark hair blowing in the wind, and the raised arm, which indicated he was facing my way and probably laughing himself into a hernia from watching my progress across the terrain. I felt myself blush, a sickening creep of heat from my shins to my cheeks, and I stood up again, trying to look as though I'd just dropped to my knees to examine a particularly interesting example of foliage. Maybe he was a walker, a picnicker off the beaten track, or one of the subset of ramblers that seemed to enjoy this social deprivation and sensory overload. Anyway, he wasn't my problem. But he didn't move, and following my fingernail trace line, I began to close on him. It became evident that the lip of the hill where he was standing concealed my destination, and I tried to work on an insouciant expression and jaunty stride so that I would look like a habitual walker by the time I reached him. There had been something about that slender, dark outline against the heather that made me not want to look like someone who only went outside to fetch the milk in when I reached him. Everything conspired against me. Roots caught at my ankles, small splashes of junior bogland soaked my socks, and I was hot and sweaty and red-faced, realising that the stone and a half that I'd gradually put on almost unnoticed over the last couple of years, that stone and a half that had tipped me over the edge from well-rounded to definitely plump, wasn't conducive to several miles of off-road walking. Plus, the last bit of the walk was up a steep slope, and the weight of my rucksack kept dragging me backwards, so I made it to the lip of the gully where the man stood, whilst giving the impression of one who was tied to an invisible companion by bungee cord. To make things worse, from the looks of it, the man had watched me every inch of my approach, because he was casually leaning against one of the gnarly, stunted trees as I breasted the final rise and came face to face with him. He wasn't alone. There was a woman there, too, sitting on a rug on a patch of grass with her knees drawn up under her chin. Sunlight, dappled to pointillism by the trees and the frequent clouds, illuminated her and made it clear that she was crying. It looked as though I had walked all those miles over the landscape, only to drop in on a Wuthering Heights remake. Hello. I tried to smile and pass on by, although where I would have passed on too, given that this sight was drawn all over in highlight pen on my map, I wasn't sure. The man moved away from the trees and towards the crying woman, putting a protective arm around her shoulders as though I was about to go for her. It's all right. I heard him say softly. Jen, please don't cry again. It looked like a stage set or a magazine shoot. Slivers of sunlight falling on the tartan picnic rug and the blonde-haired woman in her cute dungarees and highlighting the dark-haired man who bent over her in such a concerned way. Only a slight haze in the air and a faint smell reminiscent of kilns spoilt the illusion of emotional turmoil in nature. The woman dropped her head further onto her knees and sobbed harder. The man straightened away with a squeeze of her shoulder and came over to me. He was dark and slender, 
and had a pleasing arrangement of features, stubble and cheekbones, that made me feel even bigger and pinker and plainer. Are you lost? I'm looking for the Fortune House. I waved my map as though to indicate my inability to become mislaid. The man raised his eyebrows. You found it? He pointed to somewhere slightly further up the dip. Well, what's left of it? There was a fire a couple of weeks ago, so there's not much to see now. He looked me up and down. Professional interest? What an odd phrase. Or maybe he thought I was a fire investigator. I assumed anyone trying to look into the explosion and fire would have at least had an iPad. All I had was a Ford Fiesta parked on the road three miles away, borrowed gear, and a lot of sweat. No, my... Someone I knew died in the fire. I came to... To what? Pay my respects to a man who dumped me, leaving me with a house we were supposed to be renovating and a diminished sense of self-esteem? Why had I come? Really? To see where he died, I finished, rather lamely. The man waved a hand again. It's this way. The woman had looked up, finally. Her face was tracked with tears, and she looked genuinely distraught. You knew Grant? she asked. Yes, he was, I mean, we were married, but a long time ago. The woman got to her feet. Despite the dungarees' best attempts, I could see she was slim, as fine-boned and attractive as the dark man still hovering around beneath the trees. You're Alice. Grant talked a lot about you. My name's Jenna Albright. She didn't clarify her relationship with Grant, but she didn't need to. Her tears and the fact that she was exactly his type, blonde and girlish and long-legged, told me everything I needed to know. I looked at the man and my look must have held a question. I'm Max Albright. I'm Jenna's brother. This was my site. Your... This place has a reputation for being haunted and I've been conducting research into the psychology of ghost hunting here. He looked behind him as though the ghosts might be hiding somewhere among the rocks and trees. It's a fascinating place. I couldn't see anything fascinating about it. Boulders, tufts of sprouting bracken uncurling like cautious snails from their shells. Those finger-like trees. This is the place that I really feel could prove something. He didn't seem to be talking to me anymore. It was as if he was muttering to himself. I've been trying to get evidence. I'm writing a book. Grant was getting interested too, and he'd started to come along, sometimes. I felt myself gaping and forced myself to close my mouth. Grant actually went on ghost hunts. With you. Out here. I couldn't do it. I couldn't square the memory of my husband, whose entire view of the supernatural could have been contained in the phrase, Never really thought about it, but Buffy was hot. Sitting out here in this forsaken wilderness, waiting for a spectral activity. It just didn't compute. Like trying to imagine Marie Kondo in a chip shop. Yes. A pause. You wanted to see the house? Wanted was a strong word for the emotion I had. But I hadn't trudged three miles off-road out of mild curiosity. Something had driven me out here even if it was a feeling I still didn't really want to analyse. Loss? The absolute ending of something? But that something had ended six years ago, when Grant had given me the, I need to explore, find myself, do other things. I had retorted that he was so beige he could find himself perfectly well using a magnolia paint chart, and how had I ever stopped him doing anything he'd wanted to? when all he seemingly wanted to do was sit and watch TV, eat whatever meal I put in front of him and have no opinion on anything ever. It hadn't occurred to me then, and it had only struck me later, that what he'd really meant was that he'd met someone else. 
someone who'd found his vacillations and his lack of definition as charming as I had before I'd been married to it. And when the pain of rejection and the fear of having to manage on one income had faded, I had silently wished her well, whoever she was. It wouldn't have been this leggy blonde who was still crying, tears making her skin shimmer and bringing her into even sharper contrast with my ruddy cheeks and damp hair. Even my eyebrows were sweating. Six years ago, she would have been, by the looks of it, still at school. I came... I tailed off. I'm not sure why, I finished, honesty winning out under the man's gaze. It all sounds so unlike Grant, so unlike the Grant I knew. I corrected myself. After all, people change. But could Grant really have changed that much? Neither of them answered me. We all stood, a tableau of confused misery, with the breeze drying the sweat on my face and down my back and whipping Jenna's hair behind her in a stream of gold. My hair, of course, was blowing into my face and getting stuck to my damp forehead, making it look as though I was under attack from my own head. I'll show you the sight. The man, Max, finally broke our increasingly embarrassed deadlock with a sweep of his arm in the direction of the head of the tiny valley. Leave your rucksack here, it's a bit of a scramble. I hesitated again. The rucksack was concealing the sweaty streak that my T-shirt had become, and its overloaded heftiness at least gave me an excuse for my inelegant preambulations thus far. But Max was holding a hand out in a way that indicated he might forcibly strip it from my back if I didn't take it off, and so I reluctantly shrugged my way clear of the straps to let it fall heavily onto the grass. Were you going to camp? Jenna asked curiously as the bag failed to crumple but stood upright like a scarecrow's torso, teetering on the rutted edge of the gully. No, I just brought a few things I thought I might need. I answered in as dignified way as I could, following her brother as he began to lead the way along the side of the hill. I definitely wasn't going to admit to being so ill-prepared for this jaunt into the wilderness that I'd brought a large wool duffel coat, an umbrella and a thick jumper all of which were currently giving my rucksack its paunch. I hadn't thought to pack any food or water, and my body was letting me know how foolish this particular oversight had been with little stomach gurgles and an incipient headache. Max had vanished around a bend, hidden by a clump of weedy-looking trees with thin trunks scraping and waving against the pale sky. Their roots looked horribly veiny and gristly, clinging on to the thin soil and winding around the grey rocks that broke the ground as though the earth were bringing its bones to the surface. I stumbled, scraped my knee on shattered stone and had to use my arms to balance myself as, following the distant shape, I scrambled and slid down and around until I stopped, horrified. It wasn't a house anymore. In fact, it was hard to tell it had ever been a house. It looked more like a demolition site after a run-in with a hurricane. Bricks littered the ground in a huge circle around a confused mass of crater, ash, dust, the odd skeletal piece of wooden beam reaching out to the sky, and shattered tiles. There was still a vague feeling of heat, but that could have been me after the exertion of clambering around the gill. Shadows gathered around the base of the ruins ebbing and flowing with the light as clouds scudded across the sun. The little scoop of valley felt a million miles from any town or civilization, and I found myself shivering a bit, despite the warmth. Oh. It was all I could say. Oh. Grant had died here, blown to smithereens with the walls, roof and furniture. Anything left of him was buried under the remnants of the house, although it was hard to tell what had actually been the house and what had been thrown by the force of the explosion. But this narrow little pleat in the hillside, these anemic trees and their accompanying whippy branches and four-limb protuberances grasping at the ground, would have been the last things he saw. For one over-imaginative moment, 
the place felt haunted. I tried again to imagine Grant here. Small, unremarkable man, nondescript hair, clothes that always just were. Nothing trendy, but nothing old-fashioned, as though he were a time traveller that absolutely must not be noticed. Eyes a vague colour somewhere between brown and green, hair neither blonde nor dark. A man with, I'd always believed, no thoughts, no original ideas. Here, in this maelstrom of life, with the wind flattening the ground cover and random examples of wildlife peeping and fluttering all over. A sky that stretched like a bucket of spilled milk over the top, white and featureless, and serving only to trap the weather underneath it. Grant. Here. Are you all right? The unasked-for concern in Max's voice made my eyes prickle. Yes. Yes, of course. I kept my gaze on the gently smoking ruins so that the tears that threatened to surprise me didn't fall. I can't imagine why the hell Grant would be out here of all places. I mean, I started to gabble to justify my frozen face. I know people change, but it's only six years, not six decades. Can anyone change that much in such a short space of time? Without, like... Masses of therapy and introspection and self-analysis, and Grant didn't do introspection. He didn't do extraspection either, come to that. Is that a word? Extraspection? Well, he didn't do it, whatever it was. Life happened to Grant. He didn't do anything. I ran out of breath and stopped on a gasp, with that wrecked, tumbled building burning itself onto my retinas. There was a light touch on my shoulder. It's still a shock. The voice was soft now. You cared, once. That doesn't just go away. I sighed and turned around. Without the weight of the rucksack, to which I had become accustomed, and with the gradient of the little valley, I spun faster and more clumsily than I'd intended and almost whipped myself into Max's arms. I had to grab at his wrist to stop myself stumbling against him and precipitating the pair of us over the brick-strewn ground. He braced us both. There's a flask of tea back with Jenna, he said, without commenting on my gracelessness. Would you like some? You probably need to sit down after seeing this. He nodded behind him. And I think Jenna might like to talk to you about your husband. His tone was kind, and I felt my eyes prickle again. I didn't want to talk about Grant. I didn't even want to think about Grant. I was pink with embarrassment at my clumsiness, sweaty and moist, and comparing myself unfavourably with the blonde slenderness of Jenna and her sardonic, good-looking brother. I wanted to go home, have a hot bath, and forget this place of ear-splitting silence and smouldering ruin. But instead... I followed the dark, assured Max back along the vertiginous gully to the picnic rug, and a lot of questions. Chapter 3 Jenna had, at least, stopped crying, although her past tears had dried to shiny trails along her cheeks. She'd laid out some food, too, the kind of picnic I'd always imagined posh undergraduates at Cambridge enjoyed amidst their upper-class studies. Nibbles of phyllo pastry, olives, little fishy slabs. My stomach gurgled again over its early morning cup of tea and nothing else. Come and sit down, Max waved at the rug. Jenna, I've asked Alice to have some tea. Seeing this place has been a bit of a shock for her. As if my ego hadn't been reduced enough in the face of this pair's organised appearance. It managed to shrink a little further at his words. He'd forgotten my name. But why wouldn't he? I'd bowled up into the midst of a gathering of the family composed, looking like a jelly that's been left out of the fridge too long on a hot summer's day. Of course he'd have to grope for my name. Of course he would. And secretly, I was hoping that the cup of tea would extend to a share of the picnic nibbles. I was beginning to realise how hungry I was and how far it was to tramp back to the car through the heather and bracken. 
Jenna immediately went into hostess mode. That's a good idea. We could all do with some liquid, or we'll get awful dehydration headaches, and we probably need to get our blood sugars up a bit too. Max sighed. It was the first really human sound he'd made, and I smiled inwardly. He wasn't a total robot then. Have you been at those nutrition books again, Jen? A half-amused, half-despairing tone told me how fond he was of his sister, how tolerant and how forgiving of her foibles. My sister, he said, turning towards me as he sat down, elegantly, of course, on the mat. Does tend towards being slightly obsessional about her interests in life. Shut up. Jenna shoved a plate in his direction in a less than elegant way, and I started to warm to her a little. Judgy pants, I want to talk to Alice. A pale, fine-boned face turned up to me. Sorry, Alice. This is as awkward as hell, I know. I don't want to make you feel put on the spot or anything. But Grant... As though the name brought too many emotions, she stopped speaking and began piling tiny delicacies onto a patterned plate. Sit down and have some food first, though. She kept gathering her hair behind her head and letting it fall, either because the nape of her neck was hot or she was nervous. The likelihood was it was nerves, as she was hunched and drawn in on herself, despite her words of welcome. I sat down, stiff after the long walk and much slipping and sliding, but pretending to a degree of elegance in the face of these two immaculate people. What do you want to know? I asked, trying not to grab at the food. Max handed me a plate and I was slightly relieved to find that it was melamine. These two looked the type to have brought China to an outdoor meal miles from anywhere. I don't... I'm not sure. Jenna shook her head slowly and then did the gathering up and dropping of her hair again. Grant and I had been together for three... Yes, three years. We were starting to talk about marriage and settling down and all that sort of thing. She threw me a sideways glance. He was going to ask for a divorce first, of course. He never did. I ate a piece of the phyllo pastry. It was stuffed with anchovies and tasted homemade and delicious. Max passed me a cup and indicated the flask of tea and small jug of milk in the middle of the blanket, so I poured myself some to give me thinking time. He hadn't been in contact at all since he left. Nothing other than signing a few papers to take his name off the house insurance and a couple of other bits, and I sent all that via his mum. I didn't even know he'd stayed in Yorkshire. There was a moment of chirping silence. Birds weeped and twittered invisibly, and the heat of the sun continued, trapped under the envelope of sky whitened by a cloud sheet. Insects made little buzzy sounds at ground level, and somewhere... I could hear water running in a sullen gurgle. When you knew him, Jenna began again, slowly. Was he kind? I'd just taken an extra large mouthful of something that had turned out to be pork pie and had to chew ferociously to be able to answer without spraying pastry. Kind? I, I suppose so. He was never unkind, certainly. He was... I trailed off, trying to remember Grant's good points, the reasons we'd ever got together in the first place. He was nice, I finished. Damning him with faint praise, of course, but it was the only applicable word. Jenna smiled slowly. He was always kind to me, very sweet and gentle. I saw Max catch her eye and raise his eyebrows, and she went on. Sorry, sorry. I was in a relationship before I met him, and that wasn't always very pleasant. So Grant's kindness was the main thing I will remember him for. Her eyes clouded with tears again. I can't believe he's gone. Not like this. She waved a hand, presumably intending to indicate the exploded building. As it was around the bend in the hill, 
mostly showing that Grant's death among hills blue with heat and seething with unseen wildlife was unfitting. Another shadow passed over the sun. Jen, Max said in a concerned tone. Sorry. Her voice was small. I'm just going to go for a walk for a minute. She unfolded like an origami figure coming undone and was on her feet, walking away towards the top of the hill where more of the stretched skeletal trees clumped together for comfort on the skyline. I swallowed the last lump of pastry. I can't believe it either. What the hell was Grant doing out here? I turned to Max, who stopped in the act of stuffing an entire miniature scotch egg into his mouth in a move that made me like him a tiny bit, despite his supercilious attitude. Grant wasn't that sort of person, he just wasn't, I added, as though there might have been uncertainty in my words. Okay, Max picked up his mug of tea. Well, it's fair to say he hadn't seemed particularly involved in the whole ghost hunting thing. Not at first, he sipped. I'd gulped mine and was on to my second cup. But in the last, well, the last few months, he got interested in what I was doing at the Fortune House. I thought it was just a distraction. His eyes moved up to follow the track his sister had taken. She was invisible now among the trees. Look, I shouldn't really say anything, but I'm mentioning it to warn you. Six months ago, Jenna lost a pregnancy. The baby was unplanned, but she was so happy about it, and she and Grant were making plans, so... He tore his eyes away and back down to the food again. I think that's when Grant started taking an interest in this place. They both needed something else to think about for a while. A distraction. Jenna got very into healthy eating and exercise and things. Too much so, for a while. But, but she's better now. Grant offered to help with some of the paperwork I had to do as part of my research. Oh. I felt a sudden burst of sympathy for young Jenna, alongside a tiny needle of something I didn't want to examine. That must have been awful. Poor Jenna. Grant and fatherhood. He'd always told me that we should wait. Until we got the house straight. Until he'd set up his own business. Until, until. Until I'd realised that he really hadn't ever wanted a baby. Not with me, anyway. You're not a believer, I gather. He wasn't looking at me. He was staring out over the valley to where the hills rose further and higher as they galloped towards the unseen coast. Ghosts, hauntings, the paranormal. Not your sort of thing? I could look at him now without feeling that hot, stretchy inadequacy. He had the same long, slender form as his sister, with tapering fingers that looked as though they would be more at home playing the piano than holding morsels of food. Longish, dark hair that swept down under the line of his jaw and caught momentarily in the graphite line of stubble that highlighted his cheekbones. And black eyes that stared intently at things and then moved off restlessly to study something else. He was scarily fanciable, and I was terrified that I was going to give myself...